it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, you that our first, very first keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Hakwan Lau. So he studied at the uh, University of Hong Kong as an undergrad, moved to Oxford to uh, work with Dr. Rogers and Dr. Passingham as a PhD student. And then after his postdoc in London, he moved to Columbia to start his uh, faculty position there. And he got tenure there. Uh, and in the next, I think, seven years, he taught at UCLA and became a full professor in 2018. That was just 20 years after his first year of undergrad, just a side note. And that's amazing. Right, so uh, he has, so basically, I mean, to me, he's one of the pioneers of uh, research of uh, metacognition. Among other things, he has achieved a lot over the past 10, 20 years. Um, so this, there's a very long list of his achievements. So instead of saying that, I want to share kind of a personal anecdotal experience. So I first met Hakon in 2015 uh, at SSC in Paris. Uh, now I think about it, in hindsight, he was around the same age as I am now, but he was already a very successful scientist. Right, and I remember how quickly he kind of expressed his disapproval when he saw flaws in an argument. I think that's the quality we need as a good researcher. Uh, so with that, I would like to welcome Hakwan, and I'm very excited about his talk. Uh, so let's uh, welcome our keynote speaker, Hakwan. So today I'm going to talk about um, um, a set of processes that are sometimes I call broadly speaking the, the perceptual metacognition. So we know that in the brain there are modular specific uh, processes that we can call perception, like vision, and they are informationally encapsulated. So they are very specific. Um, and we can by now model them pretty well with like feed forward neural networks from, from AI. But I think it's also clear that human vision seems to be a lot more sophisticated. So the self-driving cars still don't, don't drive as well as, well they drive better than me, but what they don't drive is better than those of you who really drive. And I think a lot of it has to do with these uh, metacognitive control mechanisms. So they monitor the, the perceptual uh, modules and then they give feedback signals. So I'm defining perceptual metacognition in here more broadly than sometimes in the literature where people, including myself, sometimes just study confidence generation. And that's only one aspect of metacognition. I'm talking about all the monitoring and control this feedback loop that, that helps you with uh, perception. And I would argue that actually these processes in, in perception as we know it are so integral, right? So think about attention, it's already part of this kind of metacognitive processes. Um, and any kind of monitoring, as I've explained, they are actually everywhere. They are, they are ubiquitous in, in everyday perception. To the point that if you take them away, if you imagine destroying or removing all these metacognitive processes, it's hard to imagine what perception is like. And in fact, maybe there is not any. Maybe perception without any of these metacognitive processes becomes, maybe it's best conceptualized as non-conscious perception. So that actually nicely um, kind of relate to what uh, Yaron also talked about in uh, Susan Blakemore's um, idea about like, why some of these animals, maybe it's hard to imagine them, you know, given that they can clearly perceive, to imagine that they don't feel anything. And possibly, maybe because they lack these metabolic processes, they actually might be just not conscious. Uh, it's a provocative idea, and I would make it even more so just for raising the question but not answering it. That today I will relate, relate some of these two mechanisms in the human brain that actually does not have a uh, homolog in even rodents. So even some of the mammals, we don't have homologs in natural prefrontal cortex. It doesn't mean that rodents are decidedly unconscious, we don't really know. I think it's very difficult to know. But I think keeping that open, because they don't have the homolog, so we have to find some other equivalent mechanism to them, I think that would uh, present some challenge to our common concept. That's the, uh, sort of the abstract of the talk. I'm going to start the story with a, with a set of studies that might take a bit far from perception. It's not a study on perception itself, but it's a really fun study that we did. I think it's nice to talk about. So most of what I do in my lab is uh, basic neuroscience research. But a few years ago, we had an opportunity to do something with a tiny bit of more applied flavor. So my postdoc then, uh, Vincent, who's now independent uh, at the University of Montreal, and he, he had a uh, a clinical psychology background. 
So a while ago, when he was in my lab, we decided to do a study like that. We presented a lot of images to, um, to human participants while they're lying in the fMRI scanner where we're measuring some sort of blood oxygenation related signal that indirectly um, reflects some neural activity. And so we presented different images of different categories of different animals, and then we can record the, the brain activity and then train kind of uh, pattern classification algorithms or AI algorithms, if you like, to recognize those patterns. So by measuring activity in the ventral temporal stream in the higher visual areas, then we can basically decode or predict what people are seeing while they're in the scanner but from the brain activity alone. And this is not complicated anymore. It's not complicated even 10 years ago. So it's been around, this method has been around and going has gone through a considerable, considerable amount of uh, refinement. So what we did then, why do we want to do that? Because uh, we want to try to find out, identify these patterns uh, that, would, that would predict or, or correlate or represent what people are seeing. And the cool thing is these patterns also emerge even you know, when you're just lying in the scanner uh, or even here in when you're not in the scanner. Basically your brain's activity never stays silent unless you are unfortunately dead. So as long as you're alive when you're asleep, the patterns kind of act and flow. So we can actually monitor for the sort of non-conscious spontaneous occurrence of these patterns. And then while you're in the scanner, I can do close loop, real-time imaging, I measure your activity and analyze it very quickly. And then I whenever I, I find out that your brain looks like it is representing, let's say, the pattern of a snake. Uh, then I can do something to you. And it will become obvious why you want to do snakes. So actually for each subject, we'll choose two things that, that the subject claims to be afraid of. Everybody has something. I'm very much afraid of cockroaches. Uh, I'm not afraid of snakes because I'm from Hong Kong. We eat snakes. Uh, so uh, we actually eat snakes. So I'm uh, but, but, but some people are afraid of snakes. So let's say you're afraid of snakes and, uh, and spiders. I'll pick these two things. So you, you say you're afraid of them. I now know what your brain patterns are. In fact, in this in the study, we do something pretty cool. Uh, Vincent really, uh, really went, went the extra mile. And we don't even have to show you snakes and, and spiders. We can show you all the other things that, that we have, like rabbits and all other stuff. And then using a technique that, that goes to uh, basically up, put your, your brain data in the same space as other subjects. I can use other people's data to infer what your brain patterns will be like for snakes and spiders. So you may not have to see any snake, any spider. You can even know this is about snakes or spiders. Um, then I just ask the computer to flip a coin and, and randomize, pick one of these as a target and one as a control. And, and it's quite important that it's randomized by the computer, as I'll explain later. And then, okay, so I monitor this and did what I just talked about. I monitor your brain activity. Every time I, your brain seems to be representing a snake rather than a spider, I would then give you a signal that tells you you get a bit of money. Not a lot of money, like uh, like like one US dollar or so money or less. So, it's, but but we do it for hundreds of times uh, over spread over a few sessions, spread over a few days. And so the question is, what would it happen, right? So if you think about all the um, the clinical psychology literature or or the animal associated learning literature, this becomes a kind of exposure therapy or counter conditioning, if you will. So essentially, let's say I pick spider uh, as the as the pattern as an active and, and, and snake as a, as a control. So I expect that after this procedure, you will start to like spiders because the, the concept of all the representation of spiders get associated with money. So if you were very afraid of spiders in the first place, but now every time spider unconsciously happens in your brain, you get a bit of reward, then you might counter condition out the, the negative expectations of spider, and you might come to like it. So I'm cutting a lot of you know, long blood and sweat and tear here and, and so after a lot of work, we got it to work. So this is um, uh, what I'm showing on the left is amygdala uh, low signal. That is a blood oxygenation signal, and you can see that maybe for the benefit of people online, I can use this instead. Maybe it's better. So so um, so the this is a the amygdala uh, low signal in the, the measured by fMRI. So usually after seeing these images, this is before the procedure. Usually this shoots up is a positive response because. The amygdala re represents your kind of excessive physiological arousal to be threatening stimuli. And you can see that after the procedure completely flattens out, or if anything, almost like more negative. And this is a specific effect, it's not just passage of time or, or general placebo, because in the control, it doesn't show this effect at all. Uh, and on the 
right is just for someone who doesn't believe, you know, whatever fMRI signals we reflect, and I've got this brain structure for amygdala. This is a more common, uh, easy to understand physiological measure, just your skin conductance. So when you're scared, your skin you sweat a little bit, and if your skin conductance go down. So there's before the, the procedure, there's a high skin conductance response when you see these images, and after it will be reflected out. And again, it's specific to the target, but not the control. And that might sound too good to be true, and, and, and I think in a way it is. But this is already a conceptual replication of another study done by another postdoc earlier in my lab, Koizumi, which is a simpler study, I'm not going through, but conceptually similar. And there we're not dealing with these natural images, but more like well, uh, artificially created stimuli that has been conditioned with electric shock. So you're afraid of them. So Koizumi now is in uh, Sony and computers computer labs running her own research group now. Um, so that seems very good, and this I'll show you two, and in fact recently we've replicated even in patients. So in the last study, as I explained, these are not people with phobia, it's just everyone has a bit of things that they, they don't like, like, like cockroaches, worms, and stuff. But when we deal with actual patients, it also seems to work. This is not a very pretty graph because that was done over the pandemic when we couldn't actually get enough people with real phobia to come to the, come to the lab and then go, go into the scanner during the pandemic. Um, so we, we didn't have as much data as we planned to have, and then NIH also decided, in the US, decided we had to stop the study because the clinical trial, it has to be done on time, even with the pandemic and everything. So that was a bit frustrating, but statistically, in fact, it's a replication. So this is the pre-post effect. You can see for target is negative, for control is slightly negative, not nowhere nearly as much, and for neutral is, in fact, usually over passage of time, people actually will show less of these, will show more of these response, especially for, for, for patients. So it seems to replicate, uh, we, because we haven't finished the study, and, and I meanwhile left the US, so we didn't get to answer some of these more interesting questions, like how long will it last, the general bias. We hope it does, um, but I think regardless, we think this is quite interesting, because we are doing, I believe, maybe double-blinded clinical psychology for the first time. For some of you interested in psychology, you'll, you'll realize that most of clinical psychology is never double blind control. When you do talk therapy, there's no therapy, there's no placebo talk therapy. There's no you can't train, also you can't train the therapy provider to, to be blind to the purpose. So we are now taking uh, the logic of a clinical psychology treatment that is based on behavioral therapy, and then by implementing it in the brain, it's actually completely non-conscious and computerized. So we thought even there's still some uncertainty as to how useful it is. I think just in terms of experimental hygiene, it might be, might be a, a, a right step forward. So that's a story I like to tell because it sounds so triumphant and, and happy. But I usually would hide the next slide, uh, but today I'm, I think I should be more honest. Uh, so the study had one part that really disappointed me. It didn't work. Um, so this is the, I show you the physiological arousal for these uh, images. And in fact, it went down. Really in one study and sort of okay in the other two. But if you ask the subject how they feel when they look at these images, this is before and after. And of course they look exactly the same. And so there's basically a down effect there. We try to dance around and say, oh, maybe subjective ratings are not as you know objectively powerful as physiological measurements, so we should go with the physiology and ignore these you know, kind of subjective ratings anyway. But if you really think about it, we want to treat these patients, of course, don't feel better is, is not that great. Uh, it is disappointing. We made some sort of post hoc rationalization and say, well, if they treat the physiological arousal first, then, then they're not as afraid. Maybe then from there they can go through normal treatment. Right? Because normally the problem with conventional exposure therapy is people don't like it because it's so, it's so, so when you don't like spiders, and we just hang out more with spiders, then you'll be fine. They, they tend to drop out, actually, uh, especially for like for PTSD, similar to drop out. But if you first treat the physiological arousal, then they feel that they can sit still and do it, maybe then all the other therapy can work better. But despite that, I must confess it's a disappointment. But my friend and co-author, Joe Ledoux, was actually very happy with that result uh, because he, um, for many years, he studied rodents, and he's been sometimes associated with the idea that the amygdala is the fear center. But I think in the past 10, 15 years, he's been well, coming out and say, well, don't, don't, don't ever say that. I don't, I don't ever mean that, because he studied rodents, and the rodents don't, as I mentioned, doesn't have the same prefrontal cortex as we do. He actually would say, well, maybe the rodents are not conscious. I mean, I'm not saying, I don't, I wouldn't say they aren't, 
but I'm just saying, how do you know, right? You're not a rodent. And, and so he been saying that maybe we shouldn't say amygdala has anything to do with fear because we don't know. We should say amygdala is just having something to do with threat. And so he would say this is actually a very nice result in support of that because you use a non-conscious intervention method that treated the amygdala, which is just for physiological arousal. So that's perfect because when you're not, we have a non-conscious method that only treats the non-conscious physiological autonomic responses. But to treating the, uh, the subjective experience, you need to go through the frontal cortex. I thought that it was a little bit far-fetched in the beginning, but to be fair, he did write about all this before I, I started my study. So maybe that's interesting, and it motivated us to uh, look into the data more. So this is actually from the same data set and, and the same uh, researcher that's in the led the study, but it analyzed in a very different way. So when we, I told you that we put these people in the scanner and then uh, they looked at these images. And then you can now, instead of doing this kind of crazy close loop uh, your imaging, you can just look at the data and train patterns of classifiers and try to see how they would predict uh, your sleep conductance response or how they would predict your uh, subjective rating of fear. I should say that the, the subjective ratings of fear was not made inside the scanner. In the scanner, people were just told to watch those images and whenever it changes to a different category to press the button. So they were not making these ratings in the scan, but afterwards we asked them, okay, so you saw these images, now tell me how much afraid uh, how you feel when you, when you see these uh, images. And the skin conductance was measured in the scan. And, well, of course, they don't, they don't know what the skin conductance is in general. So um, if you take these different in, uh, brain areas and try to train pattern classifiers to, to predict, you'll find that actually the areas that are traditionally uh, thought to be very important for fear, like amygdala and insula and, and ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which kind of receives input from the amygdala, these areas actually are very good for predicting your skin conductance. But if you find it, want to find the best area that predicts your subjective rating, not made at the moment, but made subsequently, when you're just looking at the images, so, so let's say people subsequently rate that they're very much afraid of snakes, um, then how, what, what brain pattern will predict that, that subsequently predicted a uh, reported level of fear, is actually all in the prefrontal cortex. So these are different regions in the prefrontal cortex, especially the lateral prefrontal cortex. So that was actually quite, quite a surprising result for us. We thought that it wouldn't be so clean cut. I mean, we thought that at least the amygdala would predict that to some extent. I mean, it does, because the, your subjective ratings of fear is correlated with your physiological arousal. But we, if we try to mathematically orthogonalize it, that is to find cases where these things really dissociate, then it's become very clear uh, if you really want to predict the subjective ratings all in prefrontal cortex, not in these areas. So it seems like that this amygdala insula, if you just try your first order physiological excessive arousal, that don't necessarily uh, translate to your subjective ratings of fear unless it becomes monitored uh, by the prefrontal cortex. So, I already mentioned, so this is not during the report, because I, I need to mention that, because in the literature, there's a very forceful uh, narrative, I would say, to, to, to say that all the prefrontal stuff is all just report, and it's definitely not true. Um, and some people even write in very high profile journals and in nature reviews neuroscientists in the prefrontal response and the content free, and it's completely wrong. Uh, fortunate for our literature, I mean, if you talk to any animal physiologist who put electrodes in the natural prefrontal cortex, of course, you can read out a lot of content from the prefrontal cortex. I'll show you some of that data as well. And so I reviewed this a few years ago in this paper, and we also talked about lesion cases. So some people would say, if you lesion the prefrontal cortex, you don't go blind. Uh, yeah, we, we don't suggest you go blind, but I think it, whether it actually changes the subjective experience is something that's much more open-ended. Uh, some of these lesion cases turn out to be completely misinterpreted and, and just through folklore, as people would say these patients and so and so. When we go back to the original papers, it's nothing like what's described in the literature. So if you're curious about that, I really recommend this uh, paper where we try to set the record straight. If you lesion large bilateral, uh, you can have large bilateral lesion of the lateral prefrontal cortex in humans, some of these patients really act a bit like a zombie. They just don't, they just don't really respond. Uh, so it's hard to know what they was going from the experience because they don't tell you. Uh, they don't really respond. They, re they respond to very simple commands, like re reflexively. So there is a video in that, uh, in that paper as well. 
And if you think about the um, other methods of intervention, like putting muscle mold in animal uh, 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 prefrontal cortex, or large lesions unilaterally, but using more psychophysical methods to assess the experience, there's a fair bit of evidence that, in fact, it does change your, some aspects of your perception, especially perceptual mental condition, which is what I'm going into further. So, Metacognition, I mean, for many years, I'm probably responsible or guilty for that, so we've been studying metacognition by basically just studying confidence. So confidence, as I mentioned, metacognition broadly construed is just a mechanism for monitoring your first order, your basic uh, perceptual modules. And then one way to reflect how you're monitoring is to tell me your confidence. So if I present you something, you know, like this is a moving dot, and ask you to say whether it goes left or goes right, so that uh, your, your response if it goes left or right is called your first order or type one uh, perceptual decision or perceptual response. So you can do that, and then afterwards I can also ask you for what is your so-called your type two or, or, or mental cognitive response, which is tell me how, sh how sure you are, whether you think you're likely to be correct or not correct. So for most of us, if you, when you say you're correct, you're more likely to be correct. When you say you're sure, when you say you're not sure, you're less likely. So there should be a correspondence between them. Um, and if you imagine, let's say, just for the sake of you know, planting a seed of, of, of doubt here, uh, if you think you have a perceptual response that is very good, you can, you can do your left-right judgment, let's say 90% correct, but if you completely have no confidence, or if your confidence ratings are completely all over the place, so when you say you're sure you're not right, when you say you're not sure you're right, think about what kind of perception would that be? How, how would you have a perceptual response but you cannot have any confidence meaningfully? In fact, I would say this is a lot like the neurological condition of blind sight, which is non-conscious, right? So you blind sight patients can exactly guess what things are, but if you ask them, they say, I have no idea, right? If you make them to say, okay, tell me which of these trials, which of these half of the trials are you more sure, they all complex. So lacking this, this, this confidence rating is important, maybe it's a, I'm not saying that it is consciousness, but I'm saying if you imagine processes that completely come without that, they might mostly be non-conscious. So over the years, we have found that uh, there are uh, mechanisms in the frontal cortex that seems to do this. Uh, I'm going to talk about one new study that, that depends on this uh, one thing called the PE bias. Someone already said it's hard to replicate in some cases. In some other cases, it seems to replicate. So for example, we use this um, Method. So PE stands for positive evidence, or sometimes some of my collaborators now want to call it positive energy. So the idea is if you keep the signal to noise ratio constant, so you have moving dots, but you keep it quite difficult to do. Let's say you are always at about 70% uh, correct, right, in doing this task. But I, in one case, I just make the dots overall more, more dense. I just increase both the positive energy. So let's say overall it's moving left. I make it, I give you more dots moving left but also give you more noise dots to to the right. So, so overall, your signal to noise is constant. You, you can just about do this as well with this condition or that condition, but this stimulus just subjectively look more salient. And interestingly, people would give more confidence ratings in this condition, in the high positive energy condition. Or you can think of just um, same amount of information, but you just somehow make this stimulus bigger, more salient. Uh, under some conditions, it replicates. And it replicates not just in humans. Um, I think we, we didn't discover this phenomenon. We replicated someone else's. We have replicated it maybe three or four times in humans, but we also found it interesting that you can do it in monkeys. We did a study in monkeys where with the monkeys, they don't tell you how confident they are, but you can make monkeys uh, basically bet, right? So you can tell the monkey, if, you, if you're not sure, just abort the trial, so you can just move to the next trial very quickly. And monkeys are extremely patient. They're more impatient than teenagers. Uh, they're like, you know, Gamers, they really do very fast, especially if they're working for food and juice. So they, they, if, they, if they think that they're not right, they just move to the next trial. But if they think they're right, they just stay there, right? Because they, they, they expect to report. So we can use that to, to, to kind of assess the confidence. And in fact, using these methods, you can get them to have these kind of confidence illusions. So they're equally good in both conditions, but in one condition, they just are more sure. And you can even do it in rats. Now, rats are actually a lot smarter than mice, if you don't. Know? read a lot of rodent research, you might think they're similar, they're just rats are bigger. But it turns out rats are a lot smarter. So some people have gotten into working mice as well. 
I, I think it's a lot harder, uh, but at least some role that you can get it to work as well. There's quite the lack of potential prefrontal cortex. So there must be some homolog, or not homolog, some functionally equivalent circuit somewhere. So that already, I, don't, I want to backpack a little bit. I want to say that they have no lateral prefrontal, so they must not be conscious. I'm just saying it's much harder to know even when you don't find a homolog, and you just need to study it much more carefully. I'm sure that they don't rate it exactly the same way as human either. Uh, so we already know some of it. But anyway, this, this phenomenon is fairly robust. It's not, you know, it's, it is psychology after all. Sometimes they are hard to replicate. It's just the way it is. But I think if you have enough power, you should, you should be able to replicate this. It turns out, this is a surprise, we actually find it even replicate in neural network models. So for a long time, given that result, I've been saying that what well, that means that um, human metacognition is, is suboptimal or irrational, right? So given the two tasks are equally good, how would you rate one to be more confident than the other? That must mean your confidence is entirely subjective and heuristic. Um, so I have a postdoc who was really into uh, this kind of AI or neural AI research. So we train neural networks to uh, learn from uh, natural images and then try to um, uh, do these tasks from the, using a very simple evolution network that is not very complicated in design at all. You can basically download it and plug and play them. But the interesting part is, as soon as we move from artificial stimuli to naturalistic stimuli, then the network was learn on the statistics, then it would actually naturally give this uh, kind of response. So you will have these illusions when you have stronger contrast or stronger energy, they would just break higher confidence. Just to give you a bit of time to think about why, uh, the punchline is that actually, if you think about in natural st image statistics, these things are very correlated, right? So, so in signal detection theory, we usually assume all these nice equal Gaussian. In natural world, it never happens. So in the natural world, when things that are actually likely to contain the stimulus uh, information that you want actually tend to be more salient. Anyway, so these things, these statistics are inherent in the, in the natural images. So if you actually train your network to do that, then even though you um, uh, train them to later on test them on very specific artificial stimuli, the network will already inherently learn these biases. So now we have a model. The interesting thing would be to use this model to go back to the uh, actual uh, brain data. We haven't done this for this kind of information yet. But I'm going to, for the remainder of time, tell you a bit of new, new studies uh, where we start to use this kind of approach, combining neural network models back to brain data. So I found a perfect postdoc to do that. She uh, was trained at Yale when she learned how to do some of these uh, neural network modeling and also imaging. So the idea is that we use these uh, very simple feed forward models. I mean, you probably have, must have seen or heard of some of how it works. So you just train a bunch of these artificial nodes and then you tune the waves using some sort of algorithm like backprop. Then you can actually train these networks very easily using your laptop to recognize faces, images, and categories. So you just give them an image and they will basically tell you what, what the image is um, and give, give you a very simple uh, semantic label. So you can use this kind of network to uh, uh, then uh, use something that Jack Galan at uh, Berkeley does a lot, which is to go, for, go to each voxel so you have now you have you, you now know for, for an image, if, let's say the image of chief space here, you can you now know how to activate these nodes. So these are completely abstract, just a model. But you can now go also put the person in the scanner and look at this and go through each voxel, each, each little pixel in those images, and see whether these activation patterns would correlate with the activity pattern in that image, in that voxel. And by going through many images, you will find some of them will significantly detect. So maybe this voxel would actually exactly correspond to these few nodes in the, in the network by showing many images you find correlation. So then you would then be able to interpret what different bits of the brain is doing in terms of what is likely, even assuming the underlying architecture is like this network. So why do we want to do that? The idea is that while when we study intellectual prefrontal cortex, we usually don't know what's the best stimulus. And I, it always annoys me. So people in visual in vision science and early vision, they are they have these much more sophisticated tools, right? You want to study motion area empty, use these dot motions, and they know that dot motions are better than some moving grid. All, all the models are perfectly clear in, in early vision. And V1, you use the whole patch because of, you know, Cubo and Miso and all these decades of, of physiology. When it comes to prefrontal cortex, I have no idea what, what's the best stimulus. So I just want to use these and find, okay, well, tell me which of these layers, what would call it best, and I'll find the stimulus that would activate this best 
and I'll put the person in the scanner, and then I'll find the best stimulus for activating the funnel. It turns out to be a really interesting story. First part is just sanity checks. So these are two subjects here. In fact, this is taken from uh, an open data set that you can all have access to. It's seven Tesla imaging. It's got a uh, natural scene uh, data set, SNSD. It's from uh, Hendrik K's lab. I can send you reference later uh, if you want. Uh, so there's an open data set with eight sub subjects with a lot of seven Tesla data. So we use that data set and, and uh, fit those models like what I exactly did. And we found that, in fact, um, for some areas in the lateral prefrontal cortex, especially some of them are posterior to the prefrontal, like the motor area, but also ventral uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, you can find voxels that significantly correlate with features in a simple convolution network. And they correlate particularly better in the later layer, as you expect, they're more like the semantics. But the interesting thing is even for the early layers, some of them, like coding colors and simple features, you already find correlates here. Uh, and that is surprising to me. I didn't quite expect it to work so well. This data set is very high powered. It's seven Tesla imaging. And most people have been scanned for multiple sessions, like 10 sessions. <coughs> Roughly, the calculation, if you are familiar with 7T to 3T, for a well-functioning 7T, basically, you are effectively getting four times the data. So that's from some calculation from uh, search to Milan's group uh, in Netflix. So we're getting a lot of data, basically. So with a lot of data, you can find it. So we thought, okay, maybe just overpower, so we find these, so on, right? Now, the interesting part is we can now go close loop and judge for each subject. We find, okay, these two into these uh, layers, these nodes in the, in the network is two to activate these. Then we can then ask what is the best stimulus that actually would activate the entire prefrontal cortex of this subject. And then the, the goal is we're now doing is to find this subject, put them in the scanner, and actually present these images and test whether this image really activated the color cortex the best. But before we do that, we find something really a bit surprising. So this is uh, the first subject. These are the images based on the analysis that will activate the frontal cortex the most. Babies, 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 babies. And then it's subject two. Food, food, food. <laughs> Five is a little bit harder with the social gathering or something. Uh, so two, seven is a uh, sports event. Very shocking. It's a huge, only, only eight subjects, but uh, because of the data set, but already you see very, very significant uh, uh, individual differences. And you only see this in the prefrontal cortex, but not in the early visual area. If you want to ask for what will happen, we don't know yet. We're now going to put some people in the scanner and actually test them. So these are other people's data set. We cannot, we don't have access to these subjects, but we're going to soon do because at Brickman we also have 17 MRI. Uh, but I also we've been working on a theoretical explanation as to why that has to be taken. So we're not entirely sure yet, but I think there is a computational argument to be made that because the prefrontal cortex uses what we call dense and multi-dimensional code, so the visual cortex is like a piano. Very nice. That's why visual scientists love the visual, visual cortex. This part of the brain does this for this location. Right? There's specific, spatially specific uh, tuning is very clear. So it's like this neuron is a is a is a base neuron. This is a house neuron. This is a clown neuron. This is a the whole patch neuron for this location. It's, everything is very clear. The frontal cortex is all mixed together, and that means that for a certain kind of coding, you have many more solutions. And I think. If you're interested, we can talk more. That actually is theoretically would let you to predict exactly there should be more individual differences. And if that's true, it might not have anything to do with culture and personality, maybe just how the brain is wired. And it might also be true in other animals. That would be really wild, so we're now going to test that. But still, I already gave you a bit of hint um, as to why the content itself uh, might be coded in somewhat different ways in the prefrontal cortex. So you have this one called the sparse code, this very organized code in the, in the visual cortex. And then you have this dense and high dimensional, flexible, uh, multi solution kind of code, uh, very compressed and very, very versatile uh, kind of code uh, in the prefrontal cortex. But still, like, okay, maybe functionally there's some different, but why would, why would you want to duplicate the content this way? It always surprised me too, uh, but you know, nature. It's just the way it is, and it's messy. But I want to give you a hint at why the prefrontal content in vision may, may also not be exactly a duplication. It's just a different kind of content. 
So uh, in my book that I'm going to uh, what we talk about tomorrow. Uh, first of, by the way, the book is free, so it's not a promotion event. You can all download it. <laughs> Don't pay for it. Uh, but I hope it will be helpful to have a, have a future review. But in the book, we talk about a phenomenon called inflation. The idea is that you don't actually see so much colorful details in the periphery of your, uh, of your visual field, right? Based on your, your, your physiology, of the eyeball, the anatomy that you learn from, from high school biology, you should know that you should not be seeing that much color and detail. It's not like you see zero, but you should not be seeing like uniform. But yes, somehow, if you don't have, you just ask the person on the street, they would think that the world is pretty uniform. And it turns out that there's a uniformity illusion that would nicely explain that. If you just stare at the center of this, depends on where, where you are in the room, it may, may, may not work so well. But if you stare at it now and hold it for about 10 seconds or 5 seconds, suddenly at some point the periphery would also start to look uniform. If it, if it doesn't work, I mean the front it might work better, but if it doesn't, try it at home. So there's a point, there's a sense that basically your center fills out to the, to the periphery. So maybe that's why you think the periphery is colorful. And there are other psychophysics demonstrating that as well. If you make the periphery not colorful in, in VR, people don't notice. Because it's, so basically your peripheral colors are fake. It's not really represented in gray. You just, you just, present, you just pretend that it's, it's colorful. So I call it inflation. Uh, that was before the monetary inflation becomes so, so salient in our life. So I, now that maybe when I say inflation, they give people a bad like. Uh, but but in that space, so we, we try to do this kind of study in the scanner and try to find correlates of that. Uh, so in the scanner, we can we can present these images as, as you see. It takes a while to kick in, so we can actually titrate psychophysically and find the point uh, which is just about to kick in. So let's say for this subject, it would be uh, seven point half second. So we just present a seven point half second. So half of the time the illusion kicks in, half of the time it doesn't. So we can then find the neural patterns of activity from the lateral prefrontal cortex and see whether it predicts the illusion. It turns out it does. I mean, it's unpublished and preliminary. Uh, if you stay tuned in a few months, the, the, in a couple of months, the, the preprint should be out. But basically, the, 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 again, there's a little bit of surprising finding is that these patterns are very distributed. It's not in one area. It's all over the lateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, but it's pretty robust and it generalized to other stimuli, so it seems to be uh, there. And my point is that to the extent that the prefrontal cortex codes these um, uh, visual content, it may not be coding the same way as the visual cortex. It's not just to duplicate it and make it multidimensional. The multidimensionality, the, the, the lack of sparse nature, might be coding something more abstract, by like saying just the periphery is colorful without telling you what color it is. The periphery is uniform without telling you what the content is. It's kind of more like an abstract uh, summary. So finally, um, one study I'll just quickly mention uh, is an idea that we uh, expressed in a, in a theoretical review recently. The idea is that, well, if you think about subjective experience, a lot of people would say that it's so ineffable, it's so qualitative, it's not like you can just describe that red is just a wavelength, right? Why would it so special? Because it's subjective and qualitative. And if you go back to the philosophical analysis, uh, which I'm a huge fan of, I'm not a philosopher, one of the good arguments philosophically is to say, well, one way to think about why it's so ineffable and so qualitative is that it's expressed not in these simple categorical labels, but red is not just like red in the wavelength. Red is being represented as the color that is similar to pink and orange and purple, but not so much to blue and yellow and, and black and white. So if you express the similarity in relation to all the other possible things, in fact, what red is, is exactly, so red is exactly, this, this patch of crimson is exactly something close to scarlet, and but further from these and not further from that. And that is really, a, to me, a powerful theoretical insight into thinking what qualitative experiences are. Let's say you're, you're in pain, but you can tell me, well, the pain feels, my sharp pain feels no more different from a dull pain than a, than a gentle stroke. Well, then you probably are not really in pain. You don't, you don't even know what it is. So pain is, sharp pain is pain because it feels similar to some other kind of sensation and very different from, from others. Maybe you can encapsulate all these similarity relations. Maybe you exhaust what, what the, what the so-called inevitable qualitative content is. It's just not a symmetric label, just a very complex set of similarity relations. And um, basically, we have done a study and try to find the similarity relations. People 
people have done that. You can just decode the stimuli and see how, how decodable something is from others. But the methods are very uh, crude if you do this kind of decoding in fMRI, because in fMRI decoding, you're still looking at a resolution much higher than the underlying neural physiology. So my postdoc, Ali, was, a, was an engineer, and we did a study that is much cooler, I think, because we use a method called repetition suppression. The idea is that if two stimuli, this is the last thing, it is, I'm, I'm just gonna write on time. Okay. And so, so if you have two uh, uh, stimuli that are very similar, in fact, they would uh, show higher repetition suppression. So you have two stimuli that are identical. We show it the first time and show it the second time. We know that the neurons will fire less the second time. It's kind of like adaptation. So if you have two stimuli that are very different, and you show the second time, there will be less repetition suppression. So by the, the degree of repetition suppression, then you can then assess the underlying coding similarity. And that would go beyond the normal fMRI resolution by a lot, because it doesn't, because if you basically, the, 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 the resolution depends on the underlying physi physiology, which you show up in the voxels, even though your voxel does not have the resolution. So doing that, uh, but to the chase, in fact, one a bit out of time, you will find these activities uh, uh, in the visual cortex that will exactly uh, reflect these similarity. So you present many colors and then ask them to rate pairwise how similar they are, construct the whole space. You will find that in the visual cortex, the coding, in fact, there's more similar colors are in fact coded in more similar ways in the, in the, in the color areas. But you also find these in the peripheral cortex. So this is showing uh, color coding of uh, out of eight subjects, if six subjects show some activity, uh, this kind of tuning, uh, we will color it in a certain way. Yeah, so these are at least six out of eight. So you have a weaker effect in the prefrontal cortex, uh, but it's there. Okay. Yeah. You still have more time because we started there. No, um, I, I won't be helpful to. I don't want to get into people's lunch. So. Okay, that's okay. I'll, drop, I'll pretend to be conscientious while I <laughs> eat, eat a few more minutes. <laughs> okay. Sorry for it. So think about it. So. Why? Um, we have these different kinds of perceptual metacognition, as I hinted at. Why are we talking about it in a consciousness conference? Because if you think about it, it's not just explicit confidence. Some people say explicit confidence is post-perceptual, you know, just your confidence. Nothing to do with perception itself. When you think about it, there's also a tension. There is also implicit confidence. Even if I don't ask you to give confidence, you basically feel some sort of confidence, right? When you see something, it asserts itself as being there, right? So if you feel pain, it's not like, I don't ask you confident, you know that something is wrong. You know, even if you finally know that nothing is wrong, you have like a phantom pain or, or, or a headache, you know that it's not your brain hurting, but it feels like your brain hurting. It has this kind of statutoric status. It gives you a kind of sense that something is there. And this is also a metacognition. Uh, as we're showing that inflation is also a kind of metacognition. Even though you don't see color, but you somehow feel that there is color. Kind of is a way of thinking that your your prefrontal cortex is almost like commenting on your visual areas and say, well, even though you don't have color represented for the periphery, but I know you can get it within just one one eye movement. So I'm going to assume that you will have that signal. It's kind of like a commentary on the on the first order response, and then similarity judgments. And then something I didn't get to talk about today is that well, for all your visual cortical response to read it out is actually very common. So in the, in the neuroscience literature, we talk about these drifts. So it turns out that your visual response is very organized, but it moves around over time. Over the course of a few days or weeks, it actually tuning changes. So to read it out, you need to have mechanisms that would monitor these drifts and adjust accordingly. And I would bet, again, that all of these are likely to be done in the lateral prefrontal cortex, or at least partially depend on these feedback. Now, think about what would happen if you take away some of what would your perception be like? As I said in the beginning, maybe nothing is like. Because what, what kind of perception is that? Let's say you pain, but you can just reason it away. It doesn't, it doesn't assert itself as being, you know, something's wrong. You say, oh, pain, but I look at my hand, nothing's wrong. So I just, you know, just, just rationalize yourself out of it. You can't. The signal would always have these intrinsic, esoteric signals that are perceptual. And I want to talk about similarity. You can tell me you have a pain, but I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it's just as similar to a, to a doubt pain and, and, a, and a nothing. And w. The pain has a quality because you know the similarity almost in a compulsory way. And the readouts are, of course, also important. And if you think about why the anatomy makes a lot of sense, the lateral prefrontal cortex 
sits on top of the of the protocol hierarchy receives input from both the dorsal and ventral stream. This is, might be the first kind of connectomics analysis ever. Uh, it was a nature paper in 1992. Um, Dr. Myung analyzed all these the, the network structure of different different cortex and put the lateral prefrontal cortex right at the apex. It sits on top of all the entire visual inputs. It converges there. And it also outputs it back. So this is a new study where uh, people stimulated different parts of the lateral prefrontal cortex. Turns out, I said that it's very mixed, but there is a structure. If you stimulate different parts, it would exactly have a map of the rest of the cortex from the output side. So it's a lot like uh, how your retina has a map of the world, and B1 has a map of retina, and turns out lateral prefrontal cortex has a map of the visual cortex. So it seems to all make sense. We have this area sitting at the top and projects in a very spatially ordered way. And it turns out if you lesion these areas, as I, as I hinted at earlier, you, you knock out some of these perceptual functions. And this is a maybe really final brief mention of the study. A long time ago, I studied a blind sight patient. And what we did was I was really not very satisfied with a lot of studies on, on uh, perceptual consciousness in the field. Because usually when they say conscious, they just mean they have a very big signal. And when they say unconscious, it just means that they visually master the signal so that your, your deep prime is zero. You basically can't really see. Then you have some residual signal that you compare a huge signal with a residual signal. So of course the whole brain, a lot of areas, visual areas, are activated. But in blind sight, as I mentioned, in a non-conscious condition, you can have a good signal. You can actually exactly titrate the stimulus, such as the blind field gives you a performance exactly the same as the normal field. And if you do that, then in, of course in the blind field, the subject will say, I still see something. In the, normal, in, in the blind field, they will say they don't see anything. In the normal field, they will say they see. And, and that is exactly um, the, uh, uh, the subject is so unfortunate, but it's so so good for us experimentally because the blind field was only half of the, the, the visual field. So within the subject, we can compare blind field and normal field. And then if you then look at the brain area uh, that activates, it turns out that the biggest activation was not in the visual cortex. It's in fact, it's in the parietal and prefrontal cortex. And later on, we replicated this in, uh, in undergrads without lesioning the visual cortex. Unfortunately, we do some other psychophysics to create something like that, and it turns out again these prefrontal activities survive these controls. So these are in fact how I started this journey of thinking about what the prefrontal cortex might have to do with all these functions. Now, why so few people study this? I know why, because if you want to do good experiments, which I really want to do, this is really a kind of foolish approach. Because the visual cortex, as I mentioned, is laid out like a, like a piano, right? Everything is spatial organization. You can retinotopically map. You know exactly where the boundaries are. It's so easy to study. It's so easy to get really robust result. All the replication crisis and problems in psychology, the vision scientists usually don't care. They, they don't worry because they know that things replicate. You study four subjects. It's there in every single subject. Like they usually, the, the signal to noise is really good. And when it comes to prefrontal cortex, it's a complete mess. All the neuron, every neuron cares about everything to some extent under some conditions, but not others. And it just moves around, nothing is clear. Uh, so the, the analogy is like a drum man looking for the keys. You, know, you might know the story, like the drum man started looking for the keys under the light, and then the friends asked, like, did you drop your keys here? No, I dropped my keys over there. And so then why do you look here? Well, because the light is here. It's much easier to see the things, right? So it's similar. You, we may already know that the, the visual cortex itself is not sufficient for explaining visual awareness, but we, we're stuck because it's so easy to get good signal. And meanwhile, we know that the rodents don't even have LPFC. So that's, I think, where we're, we're stuck. But I think you know, if I convince you, maybe we should really go into the dark, to the unknown, <laughs> where there are no street lights, in particular, try to understand what might be the difference between humans and, and other mammals and other smaller animals. So, thank you. Very, very nice talk, Michael. Um, I have some questions about your positive evidence um, um, studies. So, one, one is uh, um, data related. So, I guess you also see that uh, there is a difference in, yes. So, um, people are also, humans are less confident when there is a more positive evidence than that. Is it mirror in response time? Yes. So, excellent question. Because it could be a confound, right? Almost. 
So the good thing is sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So that depends on the stimuli. You can set it up such that sometimes you will have positive evidence leading to longer reaction time, and then they will give high confidence. And some other setup would have shorter reaction time, but it also gives high confidence. So that seems to be taken care of. Do you know whether people look at response time for the alpha in the, in the Yes, so Mike Shannon, of course, uh, the, the, the guy who studied monkeys, he's obsessed with reaction. He's very much interested in reaction times because he's really, uh, he, he uses a, a more a dynamic version of signal tension theory that, that models reaction times. And he and uh, his former postdoc, Chris Fetch, I think, have looked into this very well. Great. And so that was the, the data related aspects. And the general, I still tell you, you were implying it, but I wanted to ask you to clarify this. That's the, in the case of the high positive evidence, that's your, your analogy about the, the volume being tuned up, means that this gives more activity in the drug area. Yeah, so again, the, you're right. So sometimes we found that. But I come to back paddle. So the, the paper that we really addressed that would be Cortisa here. Uh, it turns out that it's more like a multi voxel pattern rather than overall activation. I think in general, the prefrontal cortex works very differently from the visual cortex. It's not like more signal means more signal or something. It's just a, it's just a complex thing, which is very multi dimensional. So I think using more this kind of voxel pattern analysis would be more useful. But you can certainly read out confidence levels from the preferred context, that's true, using multi-dimensional ones. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a brief question. Um, do you have any idea what to expect in the dark? Bring that in the last slide. Um, if I speculate, I think we'll find something mechanistic. I think at least we won't find magic in the dark. <laughs> um, I, I think maybe one thing I can say is in this conference or, or in vision conferences, uh, quite often people would expect that the prefrontal cortex would be completely mysterious. I think at least when I was in grad school, that always the case. And that's why a lot of people don't want to study it. But I think with the AI approach uh, that we're doing, people are already modeling the prefrontal cortex in much more precise ways. Um, so I, I don't think we'll find something as simple as, you know, people and we saw and just say, like, this part is this and it, it cooked this and stuff. The prefrontal cortex would be a very much a population network, uh, but we are, but it, this is not a hand-waving thing, we can also model these kind of population networks and see what it does. So I, I think that the future is good. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, when you began your presentation, uh, there's something you said that struck me. And uh, when I, if, because you eat steak, so it, the way you react to it different from maybe somebody else. No, now what I want to know, our reaction to uh, maybe any animal we are afraid of, um, even if it's the same animal, but the, the way the mind operates, or the brain operates, um, mechanistically it can be the same, but does in any way our cultural background also distinguishes uh, the, the brain process? Yeah, again, I don't have direct data, but I would imagine so because all these uh, lateral prefrontal areas mature much later and you show generally much more uh, plasticity. And I already showed another study that there seem to be more individual differences there. I hinted that maybe the individual differences are just physiological or anatomical in the way it should be. But taken together, it certainly seemed that all these actual subjective fear is much more diverse whereas the physiological threat might be more ancient and fixed. So maybe everyone, when they see you know, a, a crocodile, they would, they would they jump a little bit, the physiological response should have it, but you know, some people might think of them as food, and some people might think of them as, uh, as, as a threat. So what, I, what I really want to know is that, that um, every human being, or even other animals, when we look at maybe the crocodile, the same thing happens in the brain, at this mechanism, uh, the, the brain. The operations of the brain or the neuron, perhaps the same, but the external human experience, is there any way it also changes the way the, the brain or the neuron operates, the operation of the brain itself? Yeah, I would imagine so. And, and 
there are classic studies from uh, social psychology that kind of maybe speak to that. So there was a study where people uh, ask, or the experimenter asked people uh, some just benign questions on a bridge, on a footbridge, and then later on uh, gave the their phone number to the to the um, subject. And then it turns out that if you do it on a footbridge where they have heightened, you know, people are scared because it, it, they're, you know, people are afraid of height. And it turns out that those people would call up the experimenter more for, for, to ask for dates because they're, they're probably misattributing their physiological arousal as if they were attracted by the experimenter. So an underlying, underlying physiology might, might just be fear of height. So I can see that that, that probably could be true. Your physiological arousal might be common in many different situations, whether you're being predator, prey, or just fear of height or anything. But then your concepts would interpret them differently and, and try to sometimes mis misattribute them. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your talk. Mm. Oh, very nice, thank you. Um, I'm thinking whether uh, many of your questions can be easily explained by if we have an internal generative model. So, um, like uh, duplicate information, and if we have a war model, uh, environment model, and we model it like a DFPFC, and then of course we have copy. So one for sensory input, one for the information the model. And also we know uh, that's a lot of uh, evidence uh, about how uh, internal model can be conscious and also can be served for like offline processing. And so um, with this model seems like a very good advantage and also can explain many of your questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, the answer is I think so. But I don't think, I, I disagree with that one word more than easily. You okay. said that I, think, I think, you know, it's a very general principle. I, I, I'm not a critic of all these like predictive generative models because in AI we also know that we need those generative models to do anything useful. But the, the challenge of course has been setting up these models precisely to do things are hard. So I'm a bit skeptical of the more you know, general unifying theory approach like free energy. But I also see that you know it has it has stimulated a lot of good detailed engineering work and experiments too. So I'm, I'm not dismissive of it. I just I want to see when I see it I would I would leave. I see it implemented and it works. Thank you. We can probably take one quick question. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering that whether we can interpret your research result in a way that you're giving a little lesser credit to preformed dark areas. I mean, for instance, even a bacterium can different can tell the difference between degrees of chemical compounds. And I mean, I, why why not we interpret your your research research uh, outcomes such as that? Uh, we give all the important prizes with, with, with respect to cognition to evolutionary or brain areas and and taking those prefrontal areas of something like more like redundant, you know, for instance, like philosophers say, epiphenomenal stuff like that. Well, the, I think that's kind of nice to connect to the earlier question too, which is what I see is the, at least one pitfall, one, one caveat of these like grand free energy principle type approach. So recently one of the best Experimental validation was actually done by my colleague uh, Takuya uh, Isomura, and they, they found that this free energy principle can explain like single cell uh, or, or cell culture kind of activity. And I think that, that to me already suggests that the principle may be too general. So you're right, so some much smaller, much more primitive uh, animals have some of these so sort of top down approach. But I think it's also fair to say our, our medical mechanisms are probably a lot more sophisticated. So you really go down through this list. I'm not sure single cell animals can break confidence meaningfully uh, or whether, whether they can make similarity judgments the same way we do. So they might have something primitive and similar. And in some ways, we all know that we, we share some genetic makeup of yeast, right? But, but it doesn't mean that we have yeast. We are, we are much more than yeast, and I don't think yeast are conscious either. So to that extent, of course, evolution is this continuum. We are, we are part of the biological family, but I think we really know that we are conscious, we don't know whether those guys are conscious, so maybe studying us is more important. And, and in humans, at least, we know that it's not redundant, right? So as I mentioned, if you leave in the refrontal cortex, it, it's a myth that it doesn't do anything. It certainly does something, especially if it's bilateral. Right? So if you leave on one side, the other side can take over, so some, some function can, can, can be 
co compensated. The large bilateral regions really, really does a lot. So it's, it's costly rather. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have one more question. Um, as the reward I brought in the run. <laughs> and um, so when it comes to prefrontal cortex, just like you mentioned, a lot of people talk about the, the function of abstraction. So do you think that the abstraction acts like a form of to transfer the image stimuli into a semantic form? If if that is true. And if la if one want to argue that prefrontal cortex is necessary for uh, conscious awareness, then it's, it's interesting to ask that the infant now without language ability or the animal now without language ability, and uh, can can they have can they also have the same types of conscious as we have if the prefrontal cortex really serve the function to sematize sematize the Im image stimuli. Yeah, I think, great question. Um, I, th I think the prefrontal cortex, one of the reasons it's so difficult to study is it does many things, right? So it's not like, even if it contributes to subjective perception, like I'm trying to argue, I, it's certainly not the primary or even the only thing it does. It certainly has language functions and all these other things. And presumably they are related, right? So so like I like mentioned earlier by Asa, like to have this generative model, you need to somewhat abstract and move to a more categorical or semantic level. And that's how you have these generated. So at the different levels, you have different uh, levels of details of abstraction. And that might be just the way it works. Um, but does it mean that if you doesn't, if you have um, uh, without language, I think the, the causality is not so simple and one-to-one. -one. So I think certainly I would, I would not imagine that you need to have language to have these functions. Uh, uh, but you might need to be able to abstract to have some of these functions, such as inflation. Right? So, so the so uniformity illusion is a case of pretty abstract. I'm saying that you basically say that there is color without knowing what specific color they are. So they are related, but the story is probably quite complex. It's not like a one-to-one -one mapping. So writing down this list, I think, would be what we doing and just talk about which of these are really the necessary conditions which aren't. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, this session will come to an end. Uh, we'll gather together at 12.15 again yeah, after lunch and then let's thank our speaker.